learned about Peggy Paul's theater's work, so we were drawn back to her unique clinic. And it was an eye-opening visit. As you'll see, Claude Pierre is facing new challenges because anorexia doesn't only affect young girls. Tonight, you'll meet parents who found Peggy through our first program, barely in time to save their little boy. And there's more, the girls that you met, whose stories are so dramatic. Now you'll see them as Lynn Sure did, transformed by constant care and unfailing devotion. <laughs> you belong among the wildflowers. You belong in a boat out at sea. Sail away, kill off the hours. You can get rid of this illness. It takes a process. It takes time. But you can get on with your life. You can have something beyond anorexia, bulimia. You can. I suppose that there is light at the end of the tunnel. There is hope. I suppose I can do anything now. <laughs> Eight months ago, when we first visited the Montreux Clinic in Victoria, Canada, the patients we met had a far bleaker outlook. Most, near death, had come here as a last hope. They were suffering from severe eating disorders, and their doctors and hospitals at home had failed them. Desperate, they and their parents turned to Peggy Claude Pierre. When these children, when these victims know that there is hope in the world, that they can make it. They hold on. They're so incredibly tenacious. And it's, it's amazing to watch them follow through. Hi, kiddo. For 10 years, Claude Pierre has applied her vision, compassion, and clear understanding to more than 400 patients with anorexia or bulimia. Sweetheart, I'll never let you down, okay? Her enormous success with this largely misunderstood condition grew out of an agonizing experience. As a single mom, a graduate student in psychology, she saved the lives of her own two anorexic teenagers. What's the prognosis for your daughters? There's no problem. Hello, Peggy. It's Dr. Lori McFarland calling. Hi, Peggy. It's Karim. As the word spread, other people brought their children to Peggy Claude Pierre. And she and her second husband, David, opened a small clinic. Its signature is the intensely personal care of each new arrival. It's, it's imperative in the first couple of weeks to establish a bond of trust that can never be broken. Remember I told you I'd come and hug you? <laughs> Claude Pierre's approach, round-the-clock supervision from a staff of care workers, and boundless, unconditional love is based on her perception that anorexia is not about food, but about self-destruction. Anorexics, she told us, are perfectionists. And when they realize they can't fix everything in the world, they believe they don't deserve to live. It was forever nighttime in her mind. She was pouring out her life's blood. But now I see the hollow cheeks and the ribs here. And yet, look at the size of the thighs. She didn't know if she was fat or thin. Oh, that's but, uh, terrifying. Refusing food, she says, is not about getting thin. It's an unconscious attempt at suicide. Fat pig, hideous, disgusting, vile, ugly, dirty, tarnished, overweight, obese. This is how anorexia makes you feel? Yeah. Last fall, Charlene, who'd come here after unsuccessful bouts with a feeding tube in a hospital, told us of the voices waging battle in her head. It was just like, it was having actual, like having actual people inside your head telling you, telling you things and telling you how you felt and how bad you were. To crush this internal civil war, Claude Pierre helps patients recognize their own self-worth, even long distance. Can you think that maybe it's time that you had a turn at being first? But you, you know, you don't feel worth anything. I know, darling. But you know what? I know you deserve it. We know you deserve it, honey. And I'd like to prove to you that it's your turn. When patients arrive, she applies another of her proven techniques, weighing them backwards 
to get the emphasis off of food and body weight while restoring physical health. Did you get good sleep? I was always hungry. And there are therapy sessions. Sarah, 15, let us sit in on hers last September. She had weighed 69 pounds when she arrived, directly from a hospital. So what happened at the hospital, darling? They just put me in the psychiatric ward. How did that make you feel? Awful. Why, darling? Because I thought they thought I was crazy. But perhaps the most haunting images from our first visit here were of Jane McCluskey. Balance on the scales. Teresa, will you come here, sweetie? Come meet over here and hold her for a sec, and then get ready to let go. So we don't get your weight, just her weight, just for, for one second. Okay, darling. And will you read, read, go down the other way and read it for me? And keep it to yourself. Yeah. Okay. Okay, hold on. Hold on, sweetheart. It's okay. Hang on. At 22, Jane was bedridden. A deathly 49 pounds when she got here from Scotland. She was so helpless, she had to be hand fed like a baby bird. That's the girl. Now that's for us, okay? Just keep looking at me, darling. Right into my eyes. Squeeze my hand. Squeeze my hand tight. Tight, tight. That's my kiss. Go, sweetie. No, come on, darling. Here you go, Angel. If you had not come here to this clinic, what do you think might have happened to you? Well, I wanted to die. Look in my hands, okay? That's what I wanted to happen. Do you think you could have gotten better by yourself? No. Do you think you could have gotten better with the hospitals? <laughs> no. Jane's nightmare began 14 years ago. And like so many of Claude Pierre's patients, she was recycled through hospitals and psychiatric wards. <laughs> 